Okay, well, let's spend some time talking about dose limits, right? And, this, and as I mentioned earlier, this is going to be both occupational and non-occupational dose limits, as well as where the heck those dose limits came from. How did we arrive at these numbers, right? Um, so here's a brief overview. Let me reposition this just a little bit. Um, we'll talk about the basic concept, like what, why basically we have dose limits. These organizations that have done the research to give us the numbers, to give us the data that we're basing um, our regulations on, uh, we'll talk about the radiation safety program at your hospital. Um, Baptist has a fairly extensive radiation safety program. Um, I think I've shared some of those documents with you. you they're available on the intranet. Um, if you ever are having a hard time falling asleep, they're really great um, cures for insomnia. Um, that's why I think it's helpful for us to have some kind of image or some kind of story in the back of our mind when we're talking about this stuff. Um, so for me, I've shared with y'all the story that I always have in the back of my mind is the story of Charlie. Um, he uh, <clears throat> was a baby whose mother had um, a lymphoma, and so she could not receive chemo. She wanted to go full term on the pregnancy. When she got the diagnosis, I think he was about three months old in utero. And so we built a vault around her womb, right, and gave her head and neck treatments and did all the calculations required to determine that the radiation treatments that she was receiving would not cause any genetic effects to Charlie. Um, and so this vault that we built, we built on plywood, and it had um, uh, pieces of lead. I have no clue where our radiation oncologist got these pieces of lead from, but it was the kind of lead... You know, I bring that back. It was sitting around in the vault. Um, it was in the radiation therapy vault. We had spare pieces of lead from when they built the vault. And so out of these scrap pieces of lead that were an inch thick, we built a protective box around, um, around his mother and did a full course of radiation treatments. And, uh, and then she delivered him. He was healthy, happy, little baby. And then she, the very next day she was in chemo, right, for systemic treatment. Um, so that's a story that I keep in the back of my head when I'm thinking about radiation safety because it helps me remember why this stuff is important. So as we're thinking about things like Alara, we're going to need to apply ourselves to memorizing some math. Um, uh, there is a little bit of memorization related to this. Um, but <clears throat> all of it's going to guide us as we're understanding what these radiation-induced responses are, what the occupational dose limits are, what non-occupational dose limits are, and then we'll, we'll wrap up this lecture with talking about pregnancy. The basic concept coming from our textbook um, is that underlying all of this radiation protection stuff is the idea that uh, radiation exposure to any organ in the human body is, is, could cause damage. Um, now, that being said, we have a number of different ways that the damage can be caused, right? We have what we would call deterministic effects of radiation um, and then stochastic effects. And then there's also what we might call radiation hormesis, which is some of the data that we've seen suggests that perhaps a small amount of radiation might actually be beneficial. So that's where some of the confusion lies, right? As we're working with this stuff, we're around this stuff every day um, as students. Um, we're being exposed to it even now as we sit here. And so as scientists, we have to kind of put on the science hat and not just assume that it's all bad. Is there ways that it could be good? If it's bad, how do we know it's bad? What kinds of exposures would we want to avoid? But that's the basic concept. So all of that has largely come out of research that has been done by international and national bodies. Um, and the book talks about the United Nations Scientific Committee on the Effects of Atomic Radiation, right? Um, UNISCEER. And I have this illustration over here on the board, and basically the way, I, I feel like the book does a good job of giving us all this information, but it doesn't really show how these regulations and how these things flow. 
So this, this page here is just protection organizations. These are just the organizations that look at the data and say, um, okay, yeah, we want to avoid that amount of exposure, or um, uh, this is the data that we got from Chernobyl. UNISCI, uh, they've published all the data on what we know about Chernobyl. They've published all the data on what we know about Fukushima. When I say all, I mean the, the ground zero kind of data. Now, there's people who continue to go there and do research. Like, there's a really interesting documentary out there from, I think, from National Geographic that deals with the, um, the fact that since Chernobyl, since the area around Chernobyl, the area called the Red Forest, has been unpopulated for so long, wild animals are starting to return there. So it's called the Wolves of Chernobyl, and it's about the biologists who are doing research on the wolves, the bison, the wild horses, the eagles, even the fish that are in this radioactive zone. Um, so research continues to go on, but those initial documents were created by this uh, UNIS here. Then they pass information along to this International Commission on uh, uh, Radiologic Protection, the ICRP. And the ICRP were the people that pushed the um, adoption of SI units. So all of this confusion that we had earlier about traditional versus SI units, like, um, you know, uh, Becquerel versus Curie or Rem versus Gray, um, that came from a decision that was made in 1989 by um, the International Commission for Radiologic Protection. They just wanted to standardize all the units. And, and yet we still see that in our workplace. There's probably machines at some of, your job, at some of the clinical sites that are reporting things in RADS or in RIM. Um, and that's because possibly the software was done before 1989. Um, then the National Council on Radiation Protection and Measurements, again, these guys are just publishing the data and just making scientific determinations, but a lot of what we know about how to prevent risks to um, fetuses comes from the NCR re report number 68 that was published in 1977. So, that's a pretty important report to have in the back of your mind. Um, you probably should just go ahead and memorize that pregnancy, a lot of how we determine risks to pregnancy comes from NCR, um, NCRP report number 68, okay? Um, and then the National Academy of Sciences. The National Academy of Sciences um, continue to fund a lot of research that's going on in this stuff. So as I apply for grants, as, as, as people apply for grants for research in this, that this is typically who we apply to. Um, they're interesting in that they've recently, they're kind of at the center of that question about radiation hormesis. Like, it's data that has been published by other organizations that has called into question the National Academy of Science about their determina determination that no amount of radiation is good. That's their scientific belief is that no amount of radiation is good, that there is, um, there is no threshold at which we could say there's benefits. Um, and yet we have some data, particularly from the nuclear weapons research in Japan, that suggests that possibly there was a decrease of cancer among some of the people who were exposed to radiation from the atomic bombs. So all of those protective agencies feed into the U.S. regulatory agencies, right? So those guys that we were just looking at are the scientific ones. Now we're talking about the bureaucratic ones, the guys who sit around all day and make rules, right? Rules for us to follow. Um, so the big one to remember here is the NCR. They're going to be the ones who enforce the standards at the federal level. And from the NCR, things go out to all these different directions, right? The NRC. Yeah, I'm sorry, the NRC. Thank you. The NRC. So let's draw this out real quick. We've got NRC, and they've gotten information from those scientific uh, organizations. And they've looked at all that information, and now they're going to make regulatory statutes. They're going to make regulations. They're going to feed those regulations into a number of different places, right? Some of it's going to go in different areas. So we've got some of it going to what are some of the federal government people who, use, who, who are regulating how we do stuff? Hmm? J -Cert. J -Cert. J -Cert. so the Joint Commission, yeah. Um, the Joint Commission 
largely is looking at like hospital acquired infections, right? They look at um, if there's people who are having repeated surgeries, things like that. They don't actually do a lot with radiation. Like they're going to buzz through our department pretty quick. Um, but folks like OSHA, um, the EPA, so the Environmental Protection Agency is going to be over things like radionuclides, right? So if it's a radionuclide, it's going to go over to the EPA. If it has to do with handling materials and things like that, so like our radiographic chemicals, we used to really sweat the OSHA uh, um, evaluations because they would come into our dark rooms and see, oh, this isn't properly ventilated, right? Um, then another kind of big one here, I'll, let me, uh, another big one here is going to be the FDA. So the Food and Drug Asso uh, uh, Administration, they deal with our contrast, right? So barium, isoview, those kinds of things. Um, all of these organizations kind of work together. Um, and then it all streams down, back down to the hospital level, <clears throat> and we have the RSC, right, the RSO, RSO, Radiation Safety Officer. So there is a flow chart to this. There's a hierarchy to this. The hierarchy, at the very top of the hierarchy is science, right, the science of these organizations that are researching stuff. That then feeds into federal statutes, and then that comes down to the local level, and then at the very end of this chain is us right? At the very bottom of this, if we were to kind of scroll this out one more step further, below the RSO, you're going to have the technologist, right? So this is the level. This is kind of the chain of command. Um, I point this out because do you see surgeons anywhere on this chain of command? Do we see nurses on this chain of command? Um, do we see respiratory therapists on the chain? Of, no, we don't. Um, they are actually in no way related to our obligations for radiation safety. They have no authority over the way that we determine whether or not an exam is safe. Even the ordering physician is not in this chain of command, right? So I want you all to know that because when you have a question about an exam, when you have a question about whether or not this is going to be a diagnostically um, optimal exam for the patient, right? You have a right to ask that question because the people that you're asking are not actually within this hierarchy, right? You are representing now the science, you're representing the NRC, you're representing the RSC, you're representing the RSO, you're, you're representing the hospital, and you're representing yourself, your own professional integrity when you have a question about this person says they have wrist pain, why are we doing a chest CT? Right? Okay. So the radiation safety program, right? Um, I have been part of radiation safety programs at different hospitals that I've been at. Um, the big thing that they're going to be doing is making sure that both occupational and non-occupational exposures to radiation are kept to a minimum, right? Um, so, the Radiation Safety Committee is typically made of people who have some kind of invested interest in the hospital. Um, they may or may not be radiologists, um, but then the information, the determinations that they make are pretty standardized. Um, they're going to feed that information to the Radiation Safety Officer, and that typically, that person is, um, I've, I've seen them wear a number of different hats. Sometimes they're a medical physicist. Sometimes they're a radiologist. Um, sometimes I've even seen people who have like a master's, but they're also nuclear medicine technologists that do it. Basically, if, if someone asks you to be an RSO, you need training, right? You have not received adequate training or licensure when you've completed the ARRT registry to step up and say, I'm going to be the RSO, right? I had someone ask me that once, will you be our RSO? And I said, yes, if you'll provide training, if you'll pay for the training. Otherwise, I'm not, um, I'm not able to do that. Um, so the RSO, uh, RSO, and this is from our book, is going to be responsible for developing a radiation safety program for the healthcare facility. They're going to maintain personal radiation monitoring records. 
and provide counseling about radiation safety, right? Um, so we had a question earlier in the class about what do you do if you've, if you've surpassed the fluoro timer on an exam, um, how does that work? The first thing that you do is you record all of it as best as you can. Um, you probably need to get some kind of photograph of either the screen or save the screenshot from the C-arm or from the fluoro unit if possible to PAX. And then the very next person you'll probably talk to is the RSO. And they'll sit down and they'll say, okay, when this kind of thing happens, this is the form that we fill out and this is how we this is how we report this to the patient or report this to the hospital or report it to whoever needs to know it, okay? But you'll notice within the radiation safety program, we've also got the technologist, right? Y'all are, we are the, um, the main um, enforcers, if you will, of the radiation safety program. So definitely wherever you're at, know what... Um, these requirements are for that institution and also for your state. Alara. Okay. Alara um, came out of research from the 1950s, and, uh, and it holds that both the effective and equivalent doses of um, technologists and also any other occupationally exposed individual can be kept well below the allowable maximal limits if we exercise three things, right? Time, distance, and shielding. Um, Exposure is directly proportional to time. The longer we're around this stuff, the more we're being exposed. Um, distance. Dose has an exact relationship to the inverse square law, right? And then there's a whole bunch of shielding requirements that come out with Alara. Um, let me see in my notes here real quick and make sure that we cover all these shielding requirements. And I'll write some of them down here. Okay, so the idea behind shielding is that we can reduce or eliminate radiation dose um, just by appropriately shielding the patient. <clears throat> no part of what we could wear is made, like, so the shielding of the, vet, like, lead vests and stuff like that, it is not made to stop the primary beam. But there is what we call, like, primary barriers and secondary barriers within the rooms that we operate, right? So primary barrier would be the barrier that's located directly behind the wall of the upright bucky, right? It, that wall is designed with a lead equivalent um, to stop the primary beam. Um, so let's talk about that. Bear with me here. So shielding, accessory shielding devices, devices that we might use for shielding either ourselves or the patient would include aprons, gloves, thyroid shields, protective glasses, right? Um, but if we're talking about building barriers within the room to protect the patient, um, if it's based on the, the peak energy that the x-ray machine can produce, right? So shielding for our x-ray machines is going to be less than the shielding required for a linear accelerator in radiation therapy. It probably will be a, about the same, though, as shielding required for a CT scanner. Because even though patient dose may be higher in the CT um, exam, the amount of energy of the primary beam is about equivalent to a diagnostic level uh, x-ray machine. Does that make sense? So the shielding can be about the same. Um, so, uh, there's a big long list of things that we're looking at, uh, for this stuff. If the peak energy of the beam is 130 kVp, um, which is about what we are normally operating with, right? 130 kVp, somewhere in that range. The primary protective barrier consists of 1.6 millimeter lead 
in that wall, right, or lead equivalent. Sometimes they can pour cement and prove that it's equivalent to that amount of lead, but typically they just use the lead. And it's going to extend about seven feet upward. And that is that primary barrier, right? So this is the primary shielding within the room. Then there's secondary radiation that's going to come either in the form of scatter or leakage or, I guess, stem radiation from the, uh, the x-ray tube housing itself. And so we need a secondary barrier, and this is typically what we're standing behind, right? We don't have the x-ray patient standing in front of our window where we can say hi to them while we're shooting the x-ray beam, right? That, that glass, that lead impregnated glass that we stand behind is designed to only to absorb secondary radiation, right? So radiation in the form of leakage or scatter, right? Um, and let me see what I've got on the way of... And another thing that we have to think about with these, these secondary barriers, so a primary barrier is pretty boring. It's just going to be a wall right behind the lead, right behind the, uh, the bucky, right? The secondary barrier typically is going to have like a little elbow to it because people need to walk in and out of it. And the reason why they have a little elbow to them, right? Do you all know what I'm talking about? They've, they've got like a funny little angle to them a lot of times. Mm -hmm. is because the reason, the reason for that is because it needs to scatter at least twice before it gets behind that barrier. So we can walk in and out of that area quickly, um, but the radiation would need to scatter a number of times off of air particles before it could get to us. So by the time it's scattered that many times, twice, at least twice, it has is, it is lost or attenuated enough of its energy to where it would probably just be absorbed by our scrubs, right? Um, so again, uh, I think the main one that I would rem remember from this, thinking about secondary things is that, number one, the radiation needs to scatter at least twice before it gets behind a, a secondary barrier, right? So scatter twice before it can get behind it. And then the other thing about it is these uh, windows that we're standing behind have typically about 1.5 millimeter lead equivalent. Um, and this comes right out of our uh, right out of our textbook. Um, and then the way that they arrived at this these numbers is a number of experiments where they determined what would be the occupational exposure to someone who's operating around this in a day in day out fashion, right? Um, so with an appropriate lead equivalent in the barrier, the exposure of, uh, of us as we're working around this stuff will not exceed the maximum allowance of one millisievert per week. One millisievert or 100 millirems per week, right? Um, in actual practice, when we're working in a well-designed facility, exposure should not exceed 0 0.02 millisieverts per week, right? Um, one last little thing that they think about when they're designing this stuff is the exposure cord, right? Some of these exposure control panels have a cord where you can, you can pull the button out, look around the barrier, right, and then make an exposure. They do not make that cord long enough for you to walk out into the x-ray room and make an exposure with it for a reason, right? They want you behind that secondary barrier before you fire the machine, okay? So that's how Alara works in our day-in, day-out um, applications of radiation safety. Okay, real quickly, the reasons that we're going through all this information and talking about this stuff so carefully is because we have a number of different radiation-induced responses. We've talked about in the past deterministic effects of radiation and also stochastic or probabilistic effects, right? Deterministic effects um, typically are going to follow what kind of graph? Does anyone remember? There's going to be a threshold. It's threshold typically nonlinear, okay? Um, particularly the early 
the early deterministic effects, so the acute radiation syndrome would be a deterministic effect. We get to what? Was it five gray or something? Um, so after five gray, we're, after this threshold, we're going to start to see people throwing up and stuff. Then it's going to enter that prodromal phase, and then it's going to accelerate again depending on the dose that they received, right? So that would be deterministic effect. Deterministic effects that we might actually encounter in, in our lives as radiation, uh, as x-ray techs, would, what are some of the deterministic effects we might actually see? Skin erythema is a big one. Skin, redness of skin is probably the number one one. Like the very first radiation dosimeter we had was this, right? We would allow people to work around it until their skin turned red. That was the skin erythema dose. So redness of skin, skin erythema. This would be the number one deterministic effect we might actually see, and I have seen this deterministic effect related to fluoro. Right? I've also seen it related to radiation therapy treatments. Um, stochastic or probabilistic effects. When I see the word stochastic, right, I just think random. These are random effects, right? So since they're random effects, they just start whenever, right? Um, you know, you walked outside and liked, you know, you went, like, and got a suntan on 1 4th of July in, like, 1998. Now you have leukemia, right? Um, <laughs> It's, there's a random quality to that, and that's all the word stochastic means, is that it's probabilistic. So the, the more times I go out every 4th of July and get a sunburn, right, the probability of me developing some kind of skin cancer increases, right? So that's what it means by it's probabilistic, right? Even though it's random in nature, um, the probability of it increases the more that I'm around it, Right? So this is what this line indicates here. And the number one thing that we're talking about here is cancer, right? But then also the pregnancy question is going to be underneath here too, right? So genetic. Genetic are going to be stochastic. So these are the, these are the two big things that we're thinking about as x-ray techs, right? Is we want to make sure that we have patients who are below any kind of exposure that's causing a deterministic effect, right? One deterministic effect that can affect us is cataracts, right? Um, we can hit a threshold of occupational exposure, particularly if we're working around fluoro machines, and after we've hit that threshold, the incidence of cataracts goes up, about 30%. Um, and then the number two, so that's number one, number two is going to be this, this question down here, right? So these two questions are going to kind of inform our discussion of occupational and non-occupational exposure. Occupational dose. Memorize this number. Um, memorize it, memorize it, memorize it. Know it in your sleep. Um, you're guaranteed probably at least two board questions just for knowing it. <clears throat> memorize the lens of the eyes. Um, occupational dose. And also the <coughs> localized areas of the hand. You'll notice that they're more, not less, than this annual occupational effective dose. The reason for that is this effective dose is a whole body dose. It's a whole body dose. So that is the amount that your entire body can receive. Now, unfortunately, <clears throat> the way we measure that is with this little thing right here, right? I am much bigger than this little thing, right? Um, this is why when we go to surgery or something, we need to wear this on the outside, okay? Um, wear it on your hat. Uh, wear it anywhere that it's actually going to record what your whole body is, being, is receiving, right? Now, with the lens of the eyes, that's one of the reasons that we wear it up here, right? Um, is, this is fairly close to both my thyroid and my eyes, Right? So even though it, it is technically reporting a whole body exposure, they can extrapolate from that what might have been his exposure to his thyroid <clears throat> or the lens of the eyes. Thyroid, the reason they might be worried about my thyroid is what? Right, and the reason they're worried about my eyes it has to do with cataract, cataract formation. Now, localized areas of the, of the skin, the primary one that we, we work with there is the hands, and this is not going to be us, it's going to be more 
the folks over in nuclear medicine because they work with radioisotopes all day long. They get to wear a ring dosimeter, right, a ring badge. Um, and this, again, comes from this in, NRCP report number 116, right? Another important thing to just go ahead and memorize, where do our occupational dose limits come from? NRCP report number 116. Um, and what we know is it's 50 millisieverts per year, right? Now from that, we can calculate um, what the lifetime effective dose limit is based on our age, right? Um, and this comes right out of our textbook. <clears throat> and this is one thing that I want us to be able to calculate. Um, there will probably be a board question about this, and no one should miss it because it's a pretty easy calculation, right? It's just your age times 10. Your age times 10. So for me, that would be like 170, right? Um, no. Uh, sorry. Really dumb math, math jokes. So for us, this is the way it, this is cumulative effective dose. Don't let the abbreviation scare you or anything. That just means cumulative effective dose. So what is the most that this person could have received for a whole body dose um, for an annu annually uh, occupationally exposed person who's 45 years old? What is it? 400 and what? Millisieverts. Millisieverts. If we're talking about the dose, we're talking about sieverts, right? If we're talking about the exposure, what term do we use for exposure now for SI units? Coulomb could give us intensity in air, but gray is what I'm looking for, like gray in tissue, right? But we, from, you're doing good. From that, we can pull, we can calculate what the sieverts is. So initially, <clears throat> the first number I'm going to plug into this equation might be in gray, gray in tissue. And the, but then at the end of the equation, I'm going to say millisieverts, right? Does that make sense? Okay. Non-occupational dose. So the dose for our patients or for caregivers or, pa or parents that, are, that accompany a child, right? Um, this is, again, coming from the, the NCRP, right? Um, so some of these abbreviations should start to look s familiar, right? Um, but they've recommended one millisievert for continuous or frequent exposures from artificial sources, and that's other than medical or radiation, okay? And they want a limit of five millisieverts for inc infrequent exposure. That's us, right? Now, you'll notice, what was ours again? What was our occupational? 50, right? 50 millisieverts. Theirs was a lot higher. Ours is a lot higher, I mean. I'm sorry. It's 10 times higher. How come it's okay for us to, how, how come it's okay for us to get zapped all the time? Why is that cool? Risk is definitely a big part of it. I mean, it's why, we, it's why we get paid the big bucks. That's what I tell people sometimes, <laughs> the patients. How come it's okay for you to be in this stuff all day long? That's why I get paid the big bucks. Um, so I've assumed some of the risk in drawing a paycheck from it. In Europe, you actually get, a, um, you actually get hazard pay. If X-ray technologists in France get hazard pay. Why don't we get hazard pay in America? They don't care. <laughs> they, don't, they, don't, they don't care. It goes back to the, what was it? Do you remember that spectrum from nihilism right over to compassion? Um, they don't care. The administrators don't care. I, I, I think that there probably are a lot of uncaring politicians out there, but my understanding is that the way bureaucracy works is that it allows some people who care and some people who don't care to have to sit in a room together until they come up with something that's like, carefully uncaring, you know. Um, so the reason is this. It has to do with the genetically significant dose, all right, GSD, SD, genetically significant dose. The GSD is something that where we look at a population, right, so a whole bunch of little people, right, all these little people, this is the way that they think about genetically significant dose, right? Now, let's say all these people were by Chernobyl, right? Chernobyl when it blew up. The genetically significant dose is going to affect this entire population, right? 
So it's, it is significant. There is going to be a genetic cause behind that. We are going to see mutation. We are going to see like those radioactive wolves, right? That are One of the reasons the biologists are so interested in these radioactive wolves is they're wondering what is the GSD for these wolves and how, can, how might that compare to human beings? One of the things that they're looking at really closely is the genetically significant dose to mice, why mice? Well, they're very, very similar to us, right? A lot of lab experimentation is done on rats and mice because they bear so many genetic similarities to us, right? And they reproduce more rapidly, so we can look at a genetically significant dose fairly quickly with that population. Now, that's one way of thinking about genetically significant dose. We're not thinking about a cataclysmic event. We're thinking about occasional exposures to radiation, right? So among all of these people, I don't know how, in, how to indicate this, but this guy in the Abraham Lincoln hat is an x-ray technologist who happens to like to take x-rays while he's wearing an Abraham Lincoln hat. Now, <clears throat> if you'll notice, within this population, there's only one person, right, who is receiving an occupational dose, right? And it's still well below what we would expect to cause any problems. Now this, say Mr. Abraham Lincoln goes and marries this lady here, right? The genetically significant dose um, is still fairly minimal. Like it is very, very minimal. In fact, it's unmeasurably small, right? And when we look at it from a population point of view, and this in a nutshell is why it's cool if we get zapped not everyone in America works as an x-ray tech, right? Um, we make up, I can't remember the last number I heard, but it was like, I think there's like 300,000 people who are employed as x-ray techs in America. I'm just making this number up, right? It is still such a small part of the population that the GSD is insignificant, like it is well below um, the levels of natural background radiation. So in a sense, not only are we taking on the risk of it, we are also assuming some responsibilities, right? Um, part of what we're doing is we're exhibiting professionalism. The, and this is the way, in a sense, to t the scientists think about professionalism, is they recognize that you are going to do your best to reduce exposure to yourself, your coworkers, and people around you so that you can keep this GSD low, okay? Just a couple more slides. So let's talk real quickly about pregnancy. <clears throat> more numbers to memorize, right? Monthly equivalent dose, right? So this is the exposure of any kind of radiation, right? Anywhere on the body. So it's a whole body equivalent dose, right? Equivalent dose we learn means that we could look at, it doesn't matter if we're talking about alpha particles, beta particles, gamma rays, x-rays, right? Um, the monthly equivalent dose is not to exceed point five millisieverts per month, and that's to the embryo fetus, right? Typically the way this is expressed in most workplaces is we're going to keep the technologist, the pregnant technologist, below that monthly dose limit, right? Bearing in mind that when we're pregnant, <clears throat> our bellies get big and there's some padding there, right? So I say all that to say that the amount that the fetus is receiving is going to be less than the amount that mommy's receiving, right? So we set the dose limit for mommy knowing that that's going to keep the dose limit for baby low too. We're going to monitor them both though. Mono mommy gets this one, right? Baby gets the one that goes underneath the lead apron. And it goes back to that same point, right? Um, the limit for the entire pregnancy is not to exceed five millisieverts after the de declaration of pregnancy. You'll notice this is well below, um, well below what we, would, what we would call any kind of genetically significant dose to that child, right? Um, so the main takeaway, I think, from this lecture that I want all of us to have, if you, if you haven't heard anything else I've said today, that's fine. But the main takeaway that I want you to understand is memorize these numbers and understand that the numbers come from some hard science. And that hard science is telling us that at the end of the day, our job is a perfectly safe job, right? If, if we're following these rules, right? 
if our administrators are following these rules, if the doctors and the patients that we serve are following these rules, if at any point someone is not following these rules, all of a sudden my job's not a very safe job, right? It's not safe for mommy, it's not safe for baby, it's not safe for the patients, it's not safe for my coworkers. And so that's why it's important to memorize these numbers, to know how shielding works, to know how distance and time work from Alara, so that you can honestly be a whistleblower. Because you will see people who try to skirt this, especially if you ever work in the state of Texas. There's a lot of people who like to shoot first and ask questions later, right? Have y'all experienced that at all in the clinical sites yet? Okay. Um, it will shock and alarm you the first time that you see it. You'll be like, what? I can't believe that actually happened. I thought Benny was insane. Um, it really does happen, and it's our job to make sure that everyone's safe because that's how we stay safe. I guarantee to you that if, if, an, if, a, if a culture of an institution or the administration of an institution or the practices of one doctor are loose towards any part of this, they're loose towards the pregnant pe tech, they're loose towards the patient, they're loose towards you, they've probably got holes all through it, right? Um, it's, I think about it like those mining disasters. Like if you walk into a coal mine <clears throat> and the place isn't properly ventilated, there's probably problems all through it. There's probably management problems. There's probably worker problems. There's probably all sorts of problems. There's red, there's red flags all over, right? So if you find one of these, chances are there's something else going on too, okay? So let's talk a little bit about risks, and this comes from that NR NCRP report number 68. <clears throat> the risk is considered negligible to a fetal at a fetal absorbed dose of 5 centigrade. Okay, so now we've bumped it to 5 centigrade. The chance of malformations is significantly increased above control levels only at doses below, above uh, 15 centigrade. 15 centigrade. These are also numbers to memorize, okay? Um, when we are, <clears throat> if, for instance, this terrible situation happens to you that happened to one of my good friends. He was working as a CT tech in a trauma hospital. A woman came in claim, uh, uh, having abdomen pain. She claimed that she'd already had a hysterectomy, so they, did a, they didn't do an HCP. They just shipped her off to CT. She got a CT scan. She was pregnant. She was trying to uh, trigger an abortion by having a CT scan, right? I think she was on methamphetamine or something. Um, my friend was the person sitting at the control panel watching these pictures come across the transom, right, and thinking, what the hell is that? Um, it was a baby. And uh, so <clears throat> what the doctors then have to do is call in the physicist, call in the RSO, the technologist. You have to very carefully document everything that you did, um, what was the distance of the exposure? How many exposures did I do? Was it APPA? Um, what was the amount, right, of the exposure? Um, I need to document all these kinds of things because what the physicist is going to do is he's going to sit down with all those numbers and look at some tables from the NCRP and determine what was the actual fetal exposure, right? And this 15 centigrade is the number that they're hoping things are below. Because honestly, above 15 centigrade is when the, the patient sits down with their doctor and they start talking about therapeutic abortion, right? Um, did you stop the, the procedure? My friend? Yeah, did, do you just stop once you notice that there's a baby there? I mean... Yes, I would. Right. I would. Now, the, what is the one exception to that? Does anyone know what the one exception is? Right, and why might they, when we have cases of like an ectopic pregnancy um, where they know that they're going to have to remove the child because it poses a risk to the mother's life um, and it's not going to be, uh, it's not going to form appropriately anyways, they may ask us, I've done CT abdomen pelvises on those patients, right? Hmm? Hmm? I don't know that I could. Oh, it was hard. It wasn't fun. Um, but the patient was aware of it. I didn't have to educate the patient at all. The doctor was aware of it. There were, everything was communicated, right? Now, um, in the CT class, we'll talk about needing to do CT can scans on pregnant people. Um, here's what, what I suggest to y'all. 
treat everyone, even the guys, like they're pregnant, and you probably will be okay, right? If you treat everyone like they're pregnant, shield everyone appropriately, use techniques that are the ones that are designated for that machine, um, if you ever have to face this situation, you can very easily report, the patient was shielded, this is the technique I used, this is the distance the machine was set at, the physicist will say, thank you, you've done everything that you could do, um, here's the amount that the patient was exposed to, we'll go, we'll go from there, okay? Um, so again, this goes back to, if, you, if you're working at a facility where people aren't following all that stuff, What's going to happen when they do have, when they have to ask this question and they decide to shoot everything at some funny technique that they made up that they can't remember, right? Um, so that's a really, really, really good question. Um, for y'all's purposes, yes. If, if for some reason you do uh, upright abdomen on a patient and it's apparent to you that there is um, a baby there, um, stop the exam. If someone is saying, why are you stopping the exam, explain to them why you're stopping the exam. If they say, continue with the exam or you're going to get fired, you can say, okay, um, take this job and shove it. It's not worth it. It's not worth it. I've walked out of places for the same reason. It's, it, at the end of the day, <clears throat> God will provide for you. I mean, I walked out of a place, didn't know what I was going to do, had a wife and a kid to feed, and I was like, this place is crazy. I called the ethics hotline over and over and over again. Uh, nothing was changing. Um, everyone thought I was nuts. I, I really felt like I've lost my mind. Fortunately, my dad was a radiologist, so I could call him and say, is this normal? Like, what's going on? Like, everyone here is acting like this is normal. Um, and I walked away from that job, and a week later, the phone rang, and they said, uh, it was a different facility. They said, hey, um, we heard you're really good. You want a job? And I said, yeah, sign me up. I didn't have to apply for a job or anything. So... Um, <clears throat> when you side with the angels, no one can be against you. Oh, thank you. This is the Simpsons Guide to Radiation. Becquerel is how brightly your cesium glows. Gray is how brightly the cesium will make you glow. And then Sieverts is how many eyes you'll have after glowing. <laughs> right? You need to print that out and put that up somewhere. Yeah.